for those people here who don't understand fully of what the purpose of Alcoholics Anonymous is, would you welcome Tony from the Interaction Group? Thanks, Sean. Good evening, everyone. My name is Tony. I am an alcoholic. And Chapter 5 of our big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, is entitled How It Works. That is precisely what I think we are to hear tonight from Jack, but uh, that is to say how the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, the program of recovery works. And this is what the big book says. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program. Usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. There are such unfortunates. They are not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. Their chances are less than average. There are those too who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders. But many of them do recover if they have the capacity to be honest. Our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, and what we are like now. If you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any lengths to get it, then you are ready to take certain steps. At some of these we balked. We thought we could find an easier, softer way, but we could not. With all the earnestness at our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Some of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas, and the result was nil until we let go absolutely. Remember that we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, powerful. Without help, it's too much for us. But there is one who has all power, that one is God. May you find him now. Half measures availed us nothing. We stood at the turning point. We asked his protection and care with complete abandon. Here are the steps we took which are suggested as a program of recovery. One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the, over to the care of God as we understood him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we'd harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Nine, made direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Ten, continued to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Eleven, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. Twelve, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Many of us exclaimed, what an order, I can't go through with it. Don't be discouraged. No one among us has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. We are not saints. The point is that we are, that we are willing to grow along spiritual lines. The principles we've set down are guides to progress. We claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. Our description of the alcoholic, the chapter to the agnostic, and our personal adventures before and after make clear three pertinent ideas. A, that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. B, that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. C, that God could and would if he were sought. Thank you, Tony. And now, the moment you've been waiting for, I'd like you to welcome Jack Brennan. Mm, that good? Good evening, friends. My name is Jack Brennan. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, y'all. That's the way they say it down in Oklahoma, y'all. I'm very happy to be here tonight and talk to you people. And I'm very happy for, you know, just to be at an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. And the second reason is that this is my last meeting on this particular tour. 
and I'm going home tomorrow to Perth and uh, take care of my chooks and whatnot. And I'll tell you something, I'll be very happy to get home. I'm quite tired, and it's been a very rewarding and very pleasant trip, and I've met a lot of people, and I'm, I'm, I'm just as happy as I can be that I was here, but I'll be just as happy to get home too, believe it. So. They said tonight that they would like me to talk on the simplicity of the program. And they know me pretty good. Because when it comes to simplicity, that's my second name. I'm a very simple individual. And there's nothing complicated about me. And when I came into AA, I just looked at what the job that had to be done. And I was ready to do it because I wanted what my sponsor had. And it was just that simple. So I'm not a very complicated fellow. In fact, I don't know how to be complicated. Uh, I, I have been sober for quite a few years now, and all I can tell you if you're new or you're just trying to come around and see what AA is about, that AA is a very wonderful, beautiful program, and it works wonderfully well for anybody that wants it to. And if you don't want it to, well, it won't work. And if you do want it to, it's guaranteed every time. Before we start off, I would like to remind you that up here in the front we have some pieces of paper. And one of them is speaking of your health, the disease of alcoholism. And I believe that we should start this meeting with a little bit of that. Because the most important thing for the alcoholic to know is that he suffers from a very real physical disease. A lot of people don't know that and it's unfortunate. But we do suffer from a very real and a very physical disease. And the good doctor here, Dr. Lester Coleman, put it in a very nice way. He said, alcoholism is an actual physical illness sometimes described as an allergy because it reflects a lack of tolerance of alcohol. It is not a mental illness. And bouts of excessive drinking commonly produce personality changes in the alcoholic which are too often mistaken as mental illness. And these temporary changes in personality are due to the chemical effect of alcohol and disappear when the alcoholic returns to sobriety. And he goes on to say that the alcoholic differs from other drinkers not by the amount of alcohol he drinks, but by his body's chemical reaction to it. An habitual drinker who drinks because he chooses to is not necessarily an alcoholic. The alcoholic may not want to drink, but he cannot control the impelling drive and the chemical need for the sustenance of alcohol. There is no cure for alcoholism. The only effective treatment is total and permanent abstinence. And then a good doctor goes on to say that anyone who thinks they might be having a little problem with alcohol should associate himself with the members of Alcoholics Anonymous who will teach him how to live with the disease that he has. And now that's a very simple, straightforward bit. I mean, it can't be complicated. You can't change it in any which way. There it is. And theoretically, we should be able to take this and give it to an alcoholic and put it in his hand and he go home and read it and not drink anymore. Because if the alcoholic understood what was here, well, then there's no reason for ever him to drink again. It's not just a question the alcoholic shouldn't drink. It's just a question that he just can't drink with his body's chemistry. So that's the disease of alcoholism. And the disease of alcoholism is a very insidious bit. The alcoholic is the last one to know that he's suffering from it. So we take pieces of paper like that and we put them out there for you to take home. And if you have somebody that might be drinking a little too heavy, might think he's an alcoholic, leave it around and let him read it, let him come to his own de decision. But for me, it's a very important thing to know that I suffer from a very real physical disease. Because when I came into AA, I thought that I was a madman. And my life uh, uh, before I came to AA was tremendously poor. And I have done everything possible that a person could do, a human being could do, and all of it negative and all of it wrong and all of it bad. And I came to AA with my, uh, my head lit up like a Christmas tree because I was, had tremendous feelings in my head about what I had done and the life I had lived. And I would like to tell you a little bit today about what happened to me before I came to AA and what brought me to AA and what's happened since I came to AA. And along the way, somewhere along the way, I'll, I'll explain to you the best way that I can 
how the simple part of this program works and how the simple part of the program works for anybody. And those people that have two problems, some people come into AA, they're too smart and they're too clever. They have two problems, and the second one is cleverness. And uh, the, it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work at all. It can't work. Because Alcoholics Anonymous and the program of AA uh, takes the, alco uh, the alcoholic and puts them down to basic factors. You're wiped out completely and you start anew just like a little child. And if you can't do that, then you've got trouble. And a lot of people have trouble. They complicate it, you see. I have seen many, uh, many fine people come into AA and get loused up and get themselves all bollocked up good. And I have seen many priests come into AA and ministers and doctors and lawyers. And all of these people seem to have uh, a tremendously hard time because they can't get the one basic thing that's needed. They can't get stupid. You see, you have to get stupid. <laughs> Uh, if you're not stupid, you're going to fight this thing and you're going to start to analyze it and you won't utilize it. And the next thing you know, you're going to be off in a corner fighting with somebody about something and you're going to get drunk because that's the way that it happens. So what I would say to anybody here tonight, if you want to know how I did it, I came to AA and I got stupid. Now, I didn't have to get stupid. I was stupid. When I arrived here, I was stupid. I was I was befred of all sense of anything at all. I had nothing. And I was down the bottom. And my sponsor told me right from the beginning, he said, Jack, there's going to be a very simple program for you. You're going to have no trouble at all. <laughs> and I said, is that right, Sam? He said, yeah, that's right, Jack. I said, how do you figure that? He said, well, you see, whatever you think is right is wrong. And whatever you think is wrong, that's what you should do, you see? <laughs> And he said, you're going to have no trouble at all. You're going to go right through this thing and it'll be beautiful. And he was right. I had no trouble whatsoever. And every time that I start to make a move, I figure, how do I think this is now? Should I do it? And if the answer was, I did think I should do it, then I didn't do it. Because it was wrong, you see. I had to think backwards like a Chinaman. That's the way that it worked for me. So now that I come and I talk to people about the simplicity of the program, and that same stupidity is still there. I don't have any trouble. I have very little trouble. And uh, I go through life and I live a good life. I, have, um, I enjoy it very much. And I just don't seem to get excited about anything anymore too much. And I think that that is what AA has done for me. It's let me be myself, you see. When I came to AA, I was all wrapped up. I was 36 different people. And many people, I say, all people that come to AA are just like that. Many, many people, because depending on who we're with, that's the face we have to show them. And the alcoholic, you know, is like many, many people hiding behind, like just like that, one in front of the other. This is the one he was born, and this is the one he creates to show to people. And whoever you're talking to, if you're talking to your boss, you put on a face, if you're talking to your wife, you put on another face. And it's only when you're alone in the morning coming off a drunk that you look at this guy and you don't like him so good. So you quickly go out and you get another drink and you bury him again and keep him, keep him under cover. And don't let anybody see that individual underneath. And if you come to AA and bring your old ways with you, like it says in the fifth chapter there, you know, well then you're not gonna get too much success. You have to get rid of that guy. You have to get rid of him and bring out this one. And that's why I say that when we come into AA, we should come in as little children, wide open in the head wide open, completely open in the head and, and, and have no preconceived ideas about anything. And I don't see for the life of me why anybody in this world can't get Alcoholics Anonymous. It's just beyond my conception that there could be anybody out there so smart that they can't get this program. Now you notice I didn't say so stupid that they can't get this program, I said so smart. Because it's obvious that people that, uh, you know, you come in and you see people that are sober and you look at them and you want what they have and you ask them how they do it and they tell you and then immediately some people start to argue about it. And that's stupid. That's not right. That's, uh, that's, that's tremendously wrong. So let me tell you what happened to me a little bit and then I'll tell you how I put the steps into my life and how I live. I was born just like everybody else. Uh, there's been a little controversy about that over the years. 
But I really was born just like everybody else. Uh, a lot of birds, a lot of people say that a bird, you know, dropped me in a rig and rut and the sun hatched me, but that's not right. I had a mother and I had a father and they loved me and I loved them and they loved me for about six months. <laughs> and after the first six months went by and the knowledge, you know, the, the new baby bit got worn off, uh, they looked at me and they wondered, you know, what was going on because I was something different. Right from the very beginning, I was different. I was a round block in a square hole. Now, doctors today, you know, they're much smarter today than they were many years ago about alcoholism. And many doctors today will tell you that there is a child who is known to be uh, predetermined to be an alcoholic chemically. Now, you see, you can't be an alcoholic till you drink. You've got to put alcohol in the mouth before you can be classed as an alcoholic. But there is a type of child around who is, as the doctors describe it, predisposed chemically to be an alcoholic when he gets to the booze. In other words, he has the body chemistry of an alcoholic. And when he picks up a drink, it's going to do something for him or her that it doesn't do for normal people. And this guy then is going to be on the road to alcoholism, you see. He will drink and get in trouble and a disease will progress in him and one day he will cross the invisible line of alcoholism and he won't even know that it happened but then when he crosses that line the next drink becomes a matter of compulsion and not choice then he is an alcoholic and it's at this point in his life that if that alcoholic could understand what's wrong with him that i think most of them would be very happy to get into aa very happy and they get into AA and not have any further trouble, but such is not the case because the alcoholic is one individual somehow, the lure of drinking or the need for drinking is so strong and nobody wants to be different, you know. Kids in class and school don't want to be different, you know. One of them by the, you know, they're wearing them things that you put on your head with the two things flapping up here and, and every kid had to have one, see, nobody wanted to be different. And if your little girl come home and said, I want one of them, and they cost $2, you had best give it to her because you're not supposed to make the children different from other people, see? So this wanting not to be different is a very important part of our life, you see? We come into AA and we don't want to be in AA because it makes us different. And when we're drinking, we want to go into the bar with the fellas and we want to have a couple of drinks like everybody else. But we suffer from the disease of alcoholism. We can't take a couple like other people can. So we are different and then we try not to be. And it's in the trying that we get in trouble. Now my mother and my father always told me, don't be worried about anything, Jack, uh, you know, just be like your brother. Well, my brother, he's dead now, but God love him. He was a good boy. He did everything right. He did everything completely right. He was always, uh, he was always right. He was never wrong. He'd come home from school. He'd put his books on the table and he'd hang up his coat in a closet and he'd take his shoes off and put his old shoes on and, and he'd change his clothes so that he can get them dirty and when the time come to do his homework he'd do it and, 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 and this guy was just, for, he, was, he was unreal he was really unreal I used to look at him and I'd say, I, I don't believe him I really don't believe him he used to save his money, he put pennies away till he got enough for a nickel and when he got a nickel, he'd put them away till he got a dime, uh, 10 cents, and then he'd get a quarter and a dollar, and he'd put that in a bank. And this guy, you know, and everybody's telling me, Jack, why don't you be like your brother? I couldn't be like my brother, no more than I could fly home to Perth tomorrow, by myself, without a plane. Because he was just one way and I was another. I'm an alcoholic, he wasn't. I was predisposed toward alcoholism. And I had what we would call the first and foremost manifestation of the disease, ungrounded and unfounded fear. See, a lot of people don't realize that the alcoholic suffers from ungrounded and unfounded fear. And you ask an alcoholic, what are you upset about? He can't tell you. He don't know. He just feels un unhappy inside. He feels like something is about to happen all the time. He's walking under a cloud and all the time is impending disaster and he goes through life this way and he doesn't know what's going to happen and there is probably nothing going to happen when I was a kid I remember when I used to read about earthquakes it used to keep me awake for a week 
and it, or, or a mountain top blowing off, you know, one of them volcanoes. I used to lay awake and worry about it. And, and this is not normal. People don't do that because their mind tells them, well, it's far away, doesn't bother you, but don't tell it to the alcoholic because it's very real to him. So this is where I was when I was a kid. When I had to go to school, I was concerned about it. I'd get to school and I'd sit there like Denny the Dunce, and my whole day was spent on one thing, wondering whether or not the nun was going to call on me and trying to squiggle down in the seat so she couldn't see me. And I thought that way I'd avoid. And this is what I did with my time in school. Do my lessons? I couldn't do my lessons. And then I had other problems because my father was an alcoholic. And when my father drank, he paralyzed me. He petrified me. I couldn't be happy with him around, you see. And I lived in fear of him. And when he was getting off a drunk, I would watch him. And he didn't hurt himself and fall down. And then when he was sober and he'd go to work and get a job, I'd watch for him to come home from work to see if he had started drinking again, you see. So I lived my life worrying about my father and worrying about my mother. When she went to the store, I went with her. And I was not a normal kid by any means. Other kids went out and they played. I was one of nine children. The other eight are all quite normal. They fight and they make love and have babies and, you know, they carry on like normal people. Uh, not me. I was different. The, I was a round block in a square hole to start with. And I didn't know I suffered from the disease of alcoholism. Nobody knew because it was not known in those times. So my mother took me to many doctors and he sat down and he looked at me and he probed me. And he said, there's something wrong with that kid. They don't know what that it is. He, but give him this and give him that and let him get plenty of sleep. They had a time eat our bed because I slept walked. I walked in my sleep. I talked in my sleep. And I would fight in my sleep. And I would do everything. And I'd get up in the morning more tired than when I went to bed. And then when I went to school, I'd sit there and I would wait to get home. And when I got home, I didn't want to be home. And I lived a hell of a life. Hell of a life. And full of fear and full of, full of everything. And, and I just couldn't live. And I hated my family. I hated to sit at the table with them. Because I didn't feel like I belonged there. And then I went to church, you see. And every time I sat in church, I'd look at the people next to me, and, and, and they had nice clothes, and they were, you know, happy-looking people, and mothers and fathers together. And I just didn't belong in church either. So I didn't belong anywhere. And my life changed radically, radically when I was 12 years old. I picked up a drink, and I found out I was an alcoholic. I picked up a drink in the bedroom with my brother, and, and, and he took two drinks out of the bottle of wine, and I took three quarters of a gallon. And uh, that was it, see? Because with that very first drink, I was relieved of ungrounded and unfounded fear. For the first time in 12 years, I knew what it was to feel good with a little alcohol. And it was an amazing experience, amazing. And the more I drank, the better I felt until I reached one place I don't remember no more. And the next day when my mother woke me up to go to church, it was a Sunday. I remember her crying very bitterly. And she said, Jack, what am I going to do with you? What am I going to do? Now I got two. I got your father laying in the bed drunk and I got you. And I said, what did I do? And I had that big knot of fear in my belly that's peculiar to alcoholics. I knew I had done something, but I couldn't tell you what that it was. And she said, Jack, for the love of God, don't ever do what you did again yesterday. And I said, what did I do? And she said, you drink almost three quarters of a gallon of wine, and then you went in the bathtub and tried to take a bath. And you passed out in the bathtub when you hit the warm water, and you were drowning in the tub and we heard you. And your father broke the door off the hinges with your brother and he pulled you out of the tub, you almost drowned. And she said, what am I going to do? And I said, Mom, stop crying. Don't worry about it. It won't ever happen again. It was a mistake. And now for the first time in my life, you see the deviation of the alcoholic. For the first time in my life, I was lying directly to her teeth. I was lying because I knew in my heart that anything that made me feel like that wine made me feel the day before that relieved me of that ungrounded, unfounded fear, I was going to have some more of that stuff. I was going to have some more of that. Because everybody was telling me, be like your brother. And I took my first drink of wine. I could be like my brother. I could be better than my brother. And now I was going to have some more. So I went to church that morning. It was a Sunday morning. I went to church. My mother told me, get up and go to church. And I went up and I went to church. And on the way, I had a brilliant brainstorm. 
I found out how I was going to drink some more. See, I was an Irish Catholic, and I was an altar boy. And uh, that's all that you need. If you're an Irish Catholic and an altar boy, you can drink like mad. And I want to tell you something. They go first class in those sacristies, too. First class. <laughs> Some of the best drinks I ever had came out of a bottle of wine in a sacristy. I'd get there at a quarter after five for the six o'clock mass, see? And I'd do what I had to do and get the altar cloths out and polish up the bottles and the plates and whatnot. And I'd have a few fast drinks and I could go to school and I could stand up. I told the nun many times, Sister, well, why don't you sit in my seat and let me take over the class today, see? <laughs> Little wine, that's all, no problem. And you know, it was good, it was real good. And I would go to church, and I would go to school, and I would do what I had to do. But I had trouble even then, because sometimes I'd get there a quarter, a quarter after five, and I'd find that the priest was already there. He got there a quarter to five, see? And he was getting his load on, and I couldn't get nothing that day, see? <laughs> and then I'd be in trouble. I'd be in trouble, and I'd be back to being Danita Dunst. So that describes my whole life, like a yo-yo, up and down, up and down. My whole life was dependent on a little wine. That's all I depended on. If I had a little wine, I was in good shape. If I didn't have any wine or a little alcohol, I was in terrible shape. I couldn't do anything. Back to Dinny the Dunce all the time. So you see, my life started at a very early age, the up and downs of alcoholism, the ins and outs. Now, 3,000 years ago, the Chinese in some of the earliest recorded history had a description of the disease of alcoholism. Uh, 3,000 years ago, the Chinese said that the man takes a drink, then a drink takes a drink, and then the drink takes the man. And that's a perfect description, 3,000 years old, of the disease of alcoholism. So I wound up on a barrier in New York, a skid row, and I lived in the streets like an animal for two and a half years. And I was full of body lice and filth, and I got hurt very badly. I fell down subway stairs, split my skull a thousand times, got hit with buses and trolley cars, you name it, happened to me. I would wake up full of blood, not even know where I was bleeding from. And I lived like that, and I cursed God every day. Every time I opened my eyes, I cursed the guy upstairs. I cursed my mother, my father, my brothers, my sisters, my kids, my wife. You, if you had a pair of shoes on, I'd spit at you when you walked by. I was one big knob of hate, that's all I want. Look what the world did to Brennan, see? Yeah. One day, it all came to a glorious end. I had a bottle of smoke, which is pain as alcohol. You buy a pint for a quarter, mix it up with a pint of, of water, and you shake it real good, and if you buy it in the Apex hardware on the Bowery, you got a good chance of staying alive. But they cater to the alcoholic clientele, see? And you go in there on a Sunday morning or afternoon, any time, you can buy a quarter for a, a pint, and you buy this good pain as alcohol. And when you mix it with the water, you shake it real good, and if it's cloudy, you can drink it. It won't kill you. It'll tear the belly out of it, but it won't, it won't kill you. And if it's real clear, like a glass of water, throw the bottle away because it'll, it, you'll drop dead immediately. You'll drink it, go blind, and die. That's what I lived on. And I had a bottle of this stuff this morning, and I went into my bar to have my morning drink in the toilet because the first one always comes up. You know how that is, right? You can't get the first one down, you have trouble. And the first one come up, that was expected. The second one come up, third one come up. And with the fourth one, half of my stomach come up. And that was a little unusual. That didn't happen all the time, see? And I collapsed. I collapsed from lack of blood, lack of strength, whatever. See, when you live in the streets for two and a half years, you're not strong at all. And, and you don't eat, and you don't sleep, you just fall down, collapse, and then you get up again and stagger a little more and fall down again. I don't think I, I moved more than two blocks in two and a half years. Up and down the street, that's all, across the road, come back to the other side. But I could have been in China for all I know, because, you know, you just fall down and that's it. And every once in a while you remember a cop rolling you over with his foot to get out of the way, stupid, get on the side. 
And, 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 and many of the time I used to lay there, I said, if only I could get up. If only I could get up and get this guy's gun, I'd take him with me when I go. Hate? You have no idea how I hate. That was terrible. Anyway, make a long story short, I collapsed in a toilet and I lay there. And it was while I was there, in a toilet, laying, bleeding like a stuck pig, that I took my first step. And I didn't even know what the first step was. I'd been to AA one time, to a meeting. My wife took me for a drink. I went to a meeting to buy a drink, to get me a drink. And when I got there, I couldn't wait because she promised me another one when I left. And I couldn't wait to get out. And I heard some jackass up here like I'm up here tonight, right? And what that he said was, don't take the first drink and you won't get drunk. And from the back of the room, I said, is that right? Really? And I said, did you figure that out all by yourself, or did somebody teach you? <laughs> because how the hell are you going to get drunk if you don't take the first drink? That's common sense. But you see, the alcoholic thinks with insanity. He can't use good common sense. That was the answer, and I rejected it. I said, I know that. That's not the answer, but that was the answer. So I left that meeting, and that was that. Now here I am dying in a toilet in a, in a bowery. And I looked at that bottle, and for the first time in my life, I didn't blame anybody else. Wasn't my wife, wasn't my kids, wasn't the cops or the tax man. It was nothing. I had no bills to pay. Nothing bothering me. I had my whiskey or my, my smoke, and I couldn't drink it. And now, up until this point, I had always said that booze was my friend. And now I looked at that bottle and I knew that that was my enemy and I had been wrong. And I admitted I was wrong. I accepted that I was wrong. I said, that's my problem. And he tried to help me and I would accept it. So I threw it over my shoulder, let me die. So I lay there and I started to, I couldn't understand why I was fighting to stay alive. Really, it occurred to me, what the hell is wrong with you? Why don't you just close your eyes and go? Why do you keep fighting? Fighting to get another drink, fighting to do this, fighting to do that, struggling to live. What do you want to live for? Die. And I was quite happy. So I closed my eyes and I went into a coma, I imagine, because I started to see pictures in my head. I know now it was the guy upstairs. I know that. With the guy upstairs, he must have looked down, he must have said, ah, at last he admitted something, right? I threw the bottle over my shoulder. And he said, well, I don't know, I've got to do something for him. So he did something for me. He started to show me pictures. My wife, good times, the kids, happy days, my mother, my father, my brothers. And, and, and nice pictures, you know. And I remember looking at them and looking at them. This is all in my head now. And then all of a sudden, here come this one picture. And I was up in the top like in a light, looking down at a whole bunch of people. And they were all talking and milling about and laughing and nicely dressed. And I said, what the hell is that one? And then all of a sudden, like a bolt out of the blue, the AA meeting I had been at, you see? And I said, oh my God. And I cursed me. I said, you damn fool. You had it in the palm of your hand, and you threw it away. They wanted to help you, and you wouldn't let them. So to make a long story short, I crawled out of there because the man upstairs told me, get the hell out of there. Try and get the AA. It might work for you yet. That's, that's exactly what happened. And I crawled out of there with that thing in my heart. I got to try and get out on the sidewalk. On my hands and knees, I crawled out. And I begged people to call AA for me, and... People, most of them kicked at me and pushed me, and I got on my back, and I'd get up again, I'd try again. And I don't know who called AA, but somebody stopped long enough to listen. And he called AA for me. I don't know whether a man or woman, white, black, or indifferent, I don't know. But somebody said, yeah, okay, I'll call AA. And he called AA for me, and I sat there, and he said, now don't move. Don't move, because you know if you move, you're lost. They won't know where to find you, and they're coming. So I sat there telling myself, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. And pretty soon a little guy about this big stood in front of me and his wife about that big. And he said to me, do you want to stop drinking? I said, oh yes, and indeed I do. And she said, 
Oh my God, look at him. And he said to her, shh, Jean, be quiet, so he won't hurt you. And she said, well, I know he won't hurt me, but oh my God, look at him. And he said, would you please be quiet? She said, yeah, but oh my God, look at him. And she wouldn't shut up for nothing. She just wouldn't shut up. And then he stood in front of her and he said, don't pay any attention to her. He said, do you want to stop drinking? I said, yeah. Now he was real close to me. He didn't care about body lights. That's all he could get from me. I didn't have nothing else. I had no shoes, I had nothing. I had dirty pair of pants on, no underwear, filthy shirt full of holes and blood. Hair down here, hadn't shaved or bathed. Or... And this guy got up real close to me. God bless him. That, that, that man was, uh, he was a beautiful man. A little bitty Jewish fellow named Sam Cohen. And he got up real close to me and I looked in his eyes and I knew I was home. Because he had AA in his eyes. Do you know what AA is? Understanding. One alcoholic for the other alcoholic. And nobody else gets in the middle. You know, they don't teach about AA in, in, in doctor's books or nothing. It's alcoholic to alcoholic. That's the way to, that's the gift that we have. The gift of understanding how another alcoholic feels and knowing how that he feels, then you have all the empathy with him that you can possibly have, and that's what he needs. So this man and I knew each other. We had only met for a couple of three minutes, but we knew each other. And he told me one thing. He said, if you come with me and Gene, you don't have to drink no more, and you're going to be fine. You're going to be real fine. Nothing's going to bother you. And I said, do you think that they'll have me? Ah, yeah. I said, I bought my clothes, you know, I don't, don't worry about that. He said, that's the least of it. The only thing that you have to worry about is don't take the first drink and you won't get drunk. Now here I am years later, same thing, but now I accepted it. So I determined that night that, or that afternoon that I'm gonna go with this man and I'm going to do all that I can. I'm not going to drink no more. That's it. One day at a time, I'm not going to drink no more. I'm finished. And I'm going to go with him and see if I can live for the next three months. Because he mentioned to me, in three months, you won't know yourself. And I knew there was an importance in three months, and I didn't know what it was, but I wanted to live for three months. And I wanted to live because if I lived three months, my wife might know about it and say, well, at least a bum tried before he died. And my sisters might know about it, and my brothers might know about it. And they wouldn't walk by me in the street, and they wouldn't say, well, at least he was a bum, but you know, he tried. That's all I wanted. And I came to AA on the arms of this little Jewish fella, and him telling me, come on, Jack, you're going to be good. And her walking on the other side, holding me up, saying, oh, my God, look at him. Yeah, and I arrived at Alcoholics Anonymous. Bankrupt in every department. Bankrupt morally, spiritually, and physically, and mentally. And I was suffering from a disease that affected me in three areas, mental, physical, and spiritual. And I came into AA hoping to live for three months and hoping that, you know, just to stay alive. That's all, I didn't want nothing. I didn't want no icing on a cake. I didn't want any cars, money, nothing. I didn't want my wife back. I didn't want anything. I just wanted to live to prove to myself that I was a good fella like I was trying to be. And you know, they say that you don't have to write a letter to the Holy Ghost if the intention in your heart is good. The priest told me that on my second meeting. And I went to a meeting and I was there early. I got there at eight o'clock. It don't start till nine in the States. And I went across the street because I was ashamed of the way I looked. And there was a little place like this in front of the church with a little bushes around. And I sat on a marble step that they had there, hiding from the world because I was so filthy dirty. And the priest here in confessions came out to have a smoke over my head. And I heard this voice saying, are you all right down there, son? And I thought it was God talking to me. I didn't. <laughs> and I looked around and I said, who is that? And he said, it's me up here. And I looked up and there was a priest. And he came down and he sat next to me. He said, how are you feeling? And I said, not too good. I said, I don't feel good at all. He says, you don't look good at all too. 
And he said, but I want to tell you something. You're going over there to the meeting in the bottom of the, of the, bottom of the school? I said, yeah, that's what I'm here for. And he said, uh, well, you have any kind of religion? I said, well, I'm an Irish Catholic, not working at it for a long time. And he said, I know about that story, too. He said, well, I want to tell you something, son. He said, there ain't nothing in here for you. What you need is over there in the basement of that church. And he said, just go over there and remember something. When those doubts come to you, and I, he told me, I told him about my wife and my family and being spread up, and I said, you know, when you're really trying, nobody wants to believe you. And I said, I'm really trying. I'm, I'm, I'm finished drinking. I'm done. And I said, I only want to live long enough to prove it to some people, you know. And when he told me one thing, he said, you know, Jack, you don't have to write a letter to the Holy Ghost if the intention in your heart is good. You don't have to prove nothing to nobody. And I remembered that. And I then went out of that place that day and I went across to my meeting and that was my second meeting. And that stayed with me all my life. For the next 35 years in AA, I have never forgotten what that man said to me. And I have stopped trying to prove anything to anybody. I don't have to prove nothing to nobody except my friend upstairs. And so me and him live very closely together and he sits on my shoulder and he walks with me and he talks with me and I have no troubles whatsoever in this world. And what happened to me can happen to you if you want it. If you want what I got, then you do what I did. And what I did was take the 12 steps immediately and put them into my life. And I didn't complicate them and I didn't louse them up. I did them just exactly as my sponsor told me to do them. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to run over them a little quickly with you here tonight. And I'm going to show you how simple that they are. And I came into AA and I had taken the first step. I admitted that my life was unmanageable and I was powerless over alcohol. I had never ever taken one drink and was able to guarantee my behavior. And that is what an alcoholic is. A man that takes a drink and can't guarantee his behavior. Well, they're in here somewhere. Can you find them for me? Uh, isn't that better? Thank you. Now uh, you're a doll. I admitted I was powerless over alcohol and my life had become unmanageable because every time that I picked up a drink, I fell into the same trap. I never ever took a good drink in my life. Not ever people out there say, well, I did. Well, I say, good for you. Good for you. You didn't pass the invisible line like I did. I was born an alcoholic. You acquired it. And that's the difference between alcoholics. But they're all the same. There is no difference whatsoever. And uh, my life was unmanageable, and your life is unmanageable if you can't get home to eat on time. And if you're taking a day off, you're taking a sickie. That's a very famous bit here in, in Australia. Sickies. I never heard of them until I got here. Uh, uh, and, and if you're taking sickies on Monday because you can't get to work and you're turning your weekends into the middle of the weekend, then your life is unmanageable. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. And you're powerless over alcohol if you can't take one drink, put the cork in a bottle and walk away. That's unmanageable. And if you go in for a drink after hours with the boys and you, you're there locking up the joint and they're home in bed sleeping already, then you're unmanageable. Your life is unmanageable. And if you drive a car drunk and you're not supposed to, well, then that's an unmanageable life. So if you look at these things simply, you'll find out very really, very quickly, that your life is unmanageable and it may not be as unmanageable as mine was, but it's unmanageable. Now, alcoholism is a long, slow train ride. Starts from there and goes to there. One wall to the other. And there's many, many stations along the way. Many stations. And you can get off that train anywhere along the way. You can get off there, and, and you can get off there before you find out what the inside of a jail looks like. And if you've never been in a straight jacket or a nut house, that's fine. You don't have to. And if you've still got your wife and family and a car and a few bucks in the bank, good for you. Good for you. That proves to me that AA is working better today than it did when I came in. That's all that it proves. It don't prove nothing that you're smart. But if you're a real smart fellow and you've got a case of the yets, you'll leave here tonight and you'll say, well, he was in jail. I haven't been in jail yet. And he's been in a nut house and a straight jacket. I ain't been in a nut house and a straight jacket yet. 
See, that's what's having a case of the yets. And if you go out and you pick up a drink because of those yets, you'll find out that you'll be in jail in a straight jacket. Everything will happen to you. That happened to you, that didn't happen to you, will. And it's only progression of disease, of alcoholism, and alcohol that will bring you into that war like it did me, 90 miles an hour. And maybe, just maybe, you might not be so fortunate as I was. So that's step one. Step two, with the power greater than myself that could restore me to sanity, it doesn't say anything about higher power, it says power. And the power of AA was given to the groups, and the group that I was carried to had my answer for living. There was nothing in that group, nothing in this world that I needed that that group couldn't provide answers. No question I had that the answer wasn't in that group. So I came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. The group of people I was brought into. And, and the minute I got there, I, I realized one thing, that this was what I had been looking for in the bottom of a bottle all my life. People that understood me, somewhere where I belonged. And I belonged in that group. They told me that. Sit down. Put your, put your feet up and relax a little bit. I'll get you a cup of coffee. Don't worry about nothing. You're going to be all right. See? They understood how I felt. And I was home. So that was my second step. And then one day I said to, I said to my friend, uh, Sam, I said, Sam, everything's going so good for me. I, I, I just feel like I gotta, I, I'm going to bust if I don't tell you. He said, what's that, Jack? I said, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for doing everything that you did for me. And he said, you have an ungrateful Irish bum. And I looked at him and I was amazed. I said, Sam, don't say that to me. You know, you're kidding, aren't you? He said, no, I'm not kidding. He said, you have an ungrateful Irish bum. You thank me for nothing. What did I do? And then he started to ask me questions. He said, you have any money in your pocket? I said, yeah. I said, I'm working. I was a dishwasher. And he said, you got a room? I said, yeah. And he said, you have shoes, don't you? I said, yeah. And pants? Yeah. Even got a couple of shirts? Yeah. And you eating? Yeah. And he said, well, all these good things, do you think I gave you them? I didn't give you them. All I did for you was pick you up outside and bring you here. And I put you where the guy upstairs could get a hold of you. I put you under the care of a man upstairs in his group. And I didn't do no more for you. I only carried the body here. And he said, only carried the body here because I was carried here. And I owed it to somebody else, so I gave it to you. And the guy that carried me here, he got carried here too. So nobody owes anything to anybody in AA. And I looked at him. I said, well, that makes, uh, you know. I said, who do we all owe? He said, the guy upstairs. Because he gave it to Bill Wilson in the beginning. And then he told me a little story. He said, Bill Wilson was about to be released from a hospital for the 57th time, the charity ward. And he said, the doctor, Silkwood, said to him, Bill, it's a shame to leave you, turn you loose. He said, because a week from now, you're going to be in trouble. And you're going to be laying in a gutter again, dying, and we'll pull you in here, and maybe next time we won't be able to save your life. And he said, Bill, it's a shame to turn you loose. You're looking so good. He said, why don't you go down the hall and take a look at that kid we brought in last night. Go down there and look at him. You'll be looking at yourself a week from now. So Bill Wilson went down there and he looked at that kid in the bed, strapped to the bed in the throes of, 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 of raven mad maniac and convulsions and, and really sick. And it was while he was in that room, he stood there looking at this kid and in his own words, he said that the room was filled with a great white light. And he said, a voice in my heart started to talk to me. And the voice in my heart told me that I had been released from the bondage of alcohol. And that I had never have to drink again. And in order to keep what I had, I must give it to that kid in the bed. And the voice urged me not to leave there, stay with him. Because when he wakes up, he's going to need somebody to understand him. And you, being an alcoholic, will understand him, so stay here with him. So Bill Wilson didn't leave the hospital that day. He left there about three weeks later with this kid. And the two of them stayed together like that. And they kept each other sober. And the next thing you know, they got another one. 
and a third and a fourth and a fifth and a tenth. And that's why we're all sitting here tonight, the alcoholics among us, because of what happened in that room some 45 years ago. So my sponsor told me this story, and he said, you don't owe me a damn thing. You owe the guy upstairs, not me. He said, because what I did for you was done for me. And that's all we do, pass on what we got so willingly for free. So I had to make a decision. I told him, I said, I've craved God every day, Sam, you know that. I've heard a lot of people, he said, I know that too. He said, but now God upstairs loves you for some reason he loves you because look what he's done for you. He's proved how much that he loves you. There's so many people out there that are sober, not sober, they're drinking and dying, and you're in here nice and safe and warm and comfortable and growing. He said, doesn't that prove something to you? The guy upstairs loves you. And it's got to be. And I had to admit it. And here was this little Jew, he convinced me real good. He said, I didn't do nothing for you. Higher power did. Call him what you want, the higher power. So I said, okay, you win. You usually do. And I said, I'm convinced. Now what do I do next? He said, well, you can talk to him just like you talk to me, Jack. And then he said, no, no. In your case, clean it up some, you know. <laughs> and I went out of there that night, and I went home, and I took... Instead of taking the bus, I walked. And I walked in the snow, and it was a cold, cold night in February. And I went home, and I walked all the way, and I talked to my friend all the way. And I said, you know, that little Jewish guy in there, he says that you love me, and it's got to be. Uh, I never could stay sober by myself, and now I'm sober. And I never had nothing, and now I get everything. And I'm eating, and I'm sleeping, and I got a room, and I got friends. I can't deny it no more. Something's helping me. It's got to be you. So I tell you what you do. From here on in, you let me know what you want me to do, and I'll do it. And I've been doing that for the past 35 years. I have there are times in my life that I'll try to help him out a little bit, you know, and it doesn't work. He don't need no help from nobody. But I get my dirty, big, stupid hands in there, and I muck up things a lot. And then I finally realize what I'm doing, my back off. So I turn my life and my will over to the care of God as I understand him, very simply, very easily, very gently. Nothing to do with religion, nothing at all what to do with religion. And then Sam asked me, he said, do you want to keep on with this program? Now what I wanted from Sam was what he had in his heart. He had peace in his heart, and I wanted that. He used to sit smoking a big cigar, see? And he was so peaceful that the ashes didn't even fall off the cigar. <laughs> he just sat there like that with his eyes closed, listening to a meeting, and I used to look at him and say, isn't he beautiful? And his wife used to look at him, she'd say, beautiful? And a dirty old man, look at his shirt, he dribbles all over his shirt. I said, that don't mean it. Look at him, he's beautiful. And she said, he's a damn old fool, that. But he had peace in his heart. And that's what I wanted. See, he was very gentle, and he never get upset with me, and no question was stupid, and he was always there with an answer, and if he didn't know the answer, he'd say, Jack, you just stand there for one minute, and I'll find out. And he'd go over, and he'd talk to somebody in the group, and he'd come back, and he'd say, what you should do is this. And I would do that, and it'd always be right. So I loved that man. I loved him real good. He was the father I never had. He was a friend I never had. He was good people. And I didn't go and ask him a question in and argue with him. I just listened to what he said, and I did it, and he always turned out right, because he had put the steps in his life. And he said to me, all right, sit down and make a searching and fearless moral inventory of you. And I did that, because he told me that it would take me about two hours. And he told me nobody was going to correct the punctuation, nobody was going to read it, it was just between me and him, or me and the guy upstairs. And then if I made a few mistakes, that was all right, as long as I was basically honest. And I said, what should go down there? He said, I'll tell you what goes down there. He said, are you a thief? Yeah. Put down there, I am a thief, or I was a thief. And he said, do you have uh, any moral obligations that you neglected? And I didn't know what he was talking about. And he said, moral obligations as a husband. You have moral obligations to your wife. I said, well, I neglected that. He said, put it down. I neglected my wife, my moral obligations to my wife. He said, how about your children? Do you ever do any? No. I don't even, you know. He said, good. 
put that down. You neglected your moral obligations to your children. Did you ever help your neighbor? No. I told him that day, I said, my attitude always was that do unto others before they do unto you. See? <laughs> and he said, that's right, that's wrong. That's the way, you don't do it that way. So he said, put that down. You never helped your neighbors. You never did anything. Do you ever vote? I said, no, you're in jail, you don't vote. You got a criminal record, you're not allowed to vote. He said, well, put that down too. You got a criminal record, you never voted. So I put it all down, and he said, you can fill it in a little bit. Did you ever stick up any banks? Yeah. He said, put that down there. Stick up a few banks here and there. And he said, when you get it all done, he said, ask yourself one question. Is there anything on that piece of paper or anything in your heart or your mind that you're deliberately holding back that you didn't write down? And if the answer is no, he said, then you've completed your fourth step. Forget about it. Take it, fold it up, stick it in the Bible. Nobody ever reads the Bible. See? <laughs> I did that. And then I called Sam up and I told him, I've taken my fifth step, uh, my fourth step, and I want to talk to you, Sam, because I need to. I got a hot potato. I got a good look at me. And I don't like me. And I want to share me with you. He said, good, fine. He said, come on over and we'll have a cup of coffee. And I went over and I sat down and I told Sam Cohn all about me. The exact nature of my wrongs. And I didn't read from a piece of paper. I told him from my heart. And when I got all through, he said, is that all? I said, that's it. He said, nothing that you're holding back from me. I said, nothing. He said, fine. Then let's go have a cup of coffee and let's forget about it. That was it. Now I had released myself up here. All those lights that were burning in my head, that tremendous amount of flame that I had going in my head was gone. And I was released too from the bondage of alcohol. Because when I saw in my fourth step what alcohol had done to me, everything on that piece of paper was drink connected, booze connected. I didn't want no more to drink. I didn't want no more to drink. I could take a bath in it today, I don't need it because I have been relieved of that, you see. And that's what happens with these steps. And when we made a decision to turn our will and life over to care of God, we understood him. To me, that was the third, uh, the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. In other words, anything that comes down to shoot for me is mine. I want it. It's from the guy upstairs. He ain't gonna hurt me. He may be make me uncomfortable for a little bit, but in the end, I'm going to be nice and I'm going to be well because I put my life and my care into his hands. And I can't get hurt. That's just the way that it works. So, and number six was I'm entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character and humbly ask him to remove our shortcomings. Character defects were things that I was doing that I wasn't supposed to be. Shortcomings were those things that I was neglecting to do like raising my children and my family and being decent to my wife. Even though I was in AA, even though I was in AA, I was still a, you know, a house devil and a street angel. That's the way it was. I never helped my kids with their homework. I never did anything like that. And one day my, I told my wife, I'm gonna help the kids with their homework because Sam said I should. She said, ah, oh, that's good, that's all right. Now I went to sixth grade, don't you see? And I go in there, and I got two smart little kids, and I said, I'm going to help you tonight instead of your mother. And they just looked at me in amazement. And they said, really? I said, really? That's it? Now tell me what you're up to. And my little girl said, I'm doing the mathematics tonight. And I said, what is that? She <laughs> and she said, well, sit down, and I'll show you. <laughs> and after about five minutes, I got up, and I said to my wife, them damn kids are too smart for me. I don't know even what they're talking about. Then I went to the boy and the same thing happened. He said, oh no, not again, here we go. And, and he's a brilliant kid, that little fellow of mine, that, that boy of mine. So I meant well, but I was along. Uh, you know, arithmetic, reading and writing and arithmetic, that's all gone. Now, they, kids don't do that no more. And you gotta go to school yourself to keep up with them. So that was a bust. But I could take them out to the park, and I could take them swimming, and I could relieve my wife of a lot of trouble by taking them out of the house and letting her clean, and I started to do that. And, and you know, we had a good life, and then things went along good. I started to do the things that I was neglected to do, and I stopped doing the things that I shouldn't be doing. 
and, and I was very happy. And I humbly asked him to remove my shortcomings, and he did. And how did he do it? Was by making me aware of them. That's all that it is. If you're sitting there waiting for God to come down and tap you on the head and give you a new life, you're crazy. It don't work that way. What he does is make you aware of them. Here come a character defect like a carrot on a string, right in front of your nose. And you push it away, you say, I get out of here, you know, and you don't worry about it. It comes back. You push it away, it comes back. You push it the other way. Damn thing comes back again. Until you do something about it. And when you say, okay, that's out of my life, that's fine. You know what happens then? Here comes another one. And he starts the same damn thing with the next one. And when you get rid of that one, here comes another one. And if you like dancing girls, man, you're going to see dancing girls all over the damn place. And when the time you turn around and walk the other way, that's the character defect being removed. And it goes over there and you bury it, see? Six foot deep, put a rock on it. And you go through life and you walk through life and all of a sudden that character defect gets up out of the grave. Comes back over here in front of your face again, there it is again. Jesus, I thought I got rid of that. No, it's there again, what are you going to do about it? Bury it again and put two rocks on it, see? Because it tells us in a book we are only human, we are not saints. And these things are going to happen, so you've got to make decisions on a daily basis of what you're going to do with your life. And then step number eight, we made a list of all places we had harmed, became willing to make amends to them all. Sure, I was willing. There was a lot of things I couldn't do. I couldn't go to banks and tell them I stuck them up and I'll pay you a nickel a week or a dime a week. <laughs> well, you know, you steal forty, eighty thousand uh, dollars 80000 you know, that's a big money. And there was no sense in me going to jail because if I went to jail, what would my children do? Just when they were getting used to the better things in life, me go to jail. So there was no use. So I made direct amends to all people, whoever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. And I made amends by going home and taking care of my family. And I made amends to a few people here and there. I owed a blind news dealer $2. That bothered the hell out of me. And I went one day and I paid that guy the $2 I owed him. And you know why we're on the subject? I didn't go to no loan agencies and take out a loan, five or $6,000, to pay my bills because then I would have had to pay that. You know, my children were without for a long time, long time, while I was laying in the gutter drinking. And it wouldn't be fair for me to come in and get a job and go to work and then start taking money out of their mouths that belonged to them to pay the bills that I had incurred on the outside while I was drinking. That wasn't fair. So I got a second job at night and I took that second job at night and I took my job at night and I paid my bills with it. And my wife, when I got paid my job, my day job, she got that money. That was hers. I never touched it. I was making amends as far as I'm concerned. And then step number 10, continue to take personal inventory. And when we were wrong, we promptly admitted it. See, there's a lot of time that I'd be walking along in the street and I'd say something to somebody or do something to somebody. I had a few men working for me, I fly off the handle in there. And my conscience became unembalmed. And I do believe that my conscience is the voice of God. And he sits on my shoulder here and he tell me, ah, that's wrong, Jack, you made a boo-boo. I knew right away when I was wrong, see? And if I didn't correct it immediately, then I didn't sleep that night. So I would go to people, I'd go to my wife when I'd scream at her. And I'd tell her I'd get outside and I'd start thinking, I'd say, that wasn't fair to do that. And I said, you know, I just blew up at her for nothing. I'm mad at this guy and I blew up at her. So I'd go back home and I'd tell her, hey, Roz, you know, I'm sorry I blew up at you. I didn't mean to do that. I shouldn't have done it. She said, that's all right. Promptly admit it. Then I saw through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God. A lot of people have a lot of trouble with that. To me, meditate is only think deeply on one subject. Now, if I want to think deeply on fishing, I'll go get a magazine on fishing and read it. And it will point my, my mind in the right direction. Or if I want to know about some particular subject, I go to the library, get a book out. If I want to know what to do with my chooks, and I do, I go to the library and get a, a, a book out on the chooks. And I got two of them home, and I just forgot about them. There'd be a lot of money due on them when I get back. But anyway, I got two books there on chooks. And when I read them, they point my mind in the chook direction, you see? And it's just that simple. 
So you want to get, you want to improve your conscious contact with God, he's sitting on your shoulder and your conscience is here. But you want to get a different feeling and you want to get closer to this guy up there. A personal contact, it's very simple. You just sit down somewhere where it's nice and quiet, no distractions, and you meditate on the good things that have happened to you since you come into AA. Count your blessings. Compare yourself with what that you were and what that you are now. And you just see in 5 or 10 or 15 seconds, your mind will be clear of everything else and you will start to count your blessings. And your mind immediately will go to the guy upstairs. And then, and he's sitting on your shoulder, he'll start to talk to you and you'll get answers that you never expected. It's the most amazing thing and very simple and very easy. All you have to do is count your blessings and put your mind in a proper order. And then you pray only for knowledge of his will for us and a power to carry it out. When I was in the hospital with a heart attack, I asked for the power to carry that out. First of all, I wanted to know if I was going to live. And six weeks later, they told me I would. And then I said, all right, now if I live, I'm talking to my friend upstairs. If I live, what do you want me to do? You want me to lay home like a vegetable in a house? Or do you want me to go back to AA and start talking at meetings? See, I missed about 20 meetings when I was in the hospital in Canada and all over the States. And I was a little confused because when I got out of the hospital, I couldn't walk from here to there. And I said, is this the way that it's going to be? <coughs> Something told me no. Something told me to get up and start to walk, and I did. And I walked a half a block, and I sat down for an hour, and I walked back a half a block, sat down for another hour. And then I walked a whole block, and I sat down for two hours, and I walked back a whole block, and I sat down for another two hours. And pretty soon I was able to walk. So my answer came. No, Jack, I don't want you to be a vegetable. I want you to go about and tell people about AA like you always did. I said, okay. So that was my communication with my friend upstairs. I said, if you want me to do that, show me how to do it. And he showed me by walking. So I walked, and I got on my feet, and I went about. And then one day I went to the doctor. I said, I, doctor, I got a call. Guy wants me up in Canada. Can I go? He said, I think you might. Let me hear your heart. So he put me on a machine, and, then, and he said, you look all right, go. But tell the woman when you get on the plane that you need oxygen, and if you need it, in a hurry to give it to you. And so I took my first flight and I went away and I had a little bit of trouble, not too much. I had pains in my chest, took my nitroglycerin, got a little oxygen, I was all right. See, so I all depend on a guy upstairs who the power to carry it out. Tell me what you want me to do. I'll do it, but let me help me. And he did. And then having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to alcoholic and practice these principles in all our affairs. The word spiritual told a lot of people. And to me, the word spiritual simply means a person. A spiritual person is a person that's wanted, needed, and loved by his actions in the world. But you can see how the alcoholic, when he puts these 11 steps into his life, and it says, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps. The spiritual awakening is when you realize, like it says in the fifth chapter, that God is doing for you what you couldn't do for yourself. That's the spiritual awakening. And you become spiritual because you are wanted, needed, and loved. Because nobody can be not wanted, needed, and loved that hasn't changed his life like the alcoholic does. He comes into AA and he turns his life and will over to the God. He makes an inventory. He gets rid of his character defects and shortcomings. Makes a list of people he had harmed. Makes amends to them all. And then he prays for knowledge of God's will for him. He has got to be spiritual. He has got to be. People want him, people need him, and people love him. And all because he came to AA and put the steps in his life. So having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried then to carry this message to other alcoholics. Is that so hard to understand? When you've got something good inside here, like Sam Cohn did, and you've got a big feeling in your heart for other people like alcoholics do have, then it becomes very important in your life to watch the door for a newcomer coming in because you are very eager to give away that you've got. That's the only way you can keep it. And then you practice these principles in all your affairs. 
You go home and you make sure that your house is in good order, your home is in good order. And if your children are running around the streets crazy, you take them in hand and you take care of them. And you don't try to buy your children and make up for the lost time that you have. They don't want that. They want a father and a mother. They don't want money. And Christmas time is coming now and I know a lot of people will be going into debt. They'll be going into debt because one will say to the other, well, it's time we give the kids a break. They've had enough poverty in their lives and enough. Let's give them a good Christmas. Let's go down and borrow some money. I say don't do it. I say don't do it. That's not what kids want. Kids want their home and they want a good, clean home and a nice home and good food. And they want their arms around them once in a while, the mother and the father both. And I found it very hard to put my arms around my kids, but I do. I do now, and I do with my grandchildren. In fact, when, my, when, my, when I get home now, I know the first thing my, grand, my granddaughter will say to me. She's 13 years old. And she'll stand there and she'll go like that, and she'll say, Pop, can, Grandpa, can I have a hug? And I'll say, you better believe it, you'll get one. And I squeeze the be Jesus out of her. And when she starts screaming, oh, that hurts, I know that it's enough. Yeah. Because I want her to know that no matter what happens with her in her life, that I love her real good. And her mother does the same thing. And my little ones, a three-year-old and a five-year-old, they'll come up to me and I know the little guy is saving Christmas spiders for me. I don't know where he gets them, but he goes out and finds Christmas spiders because he thinks that I need them. I got a whole bottle full of the damn things. <laughs> And he's three years old and he comes running with a Christmas spider. Grandpa, I got another one. Look, it isn't it beautiful. I say, yeah, it's beautiful. I'm not talking about the spider. I'm talking about him and my relation with him. See? So this is the 12 steps of AA and that's what it does for you. And that's how you become spiritual. Now, I have three children, right? I have the daughter I live with. I have a boy in New York that's studying to be a doctor one more year to go. And he'll be a doctor out and operating on people and whatnot. I'm very proud of him, my AA baby. And then I have my oldest son. My father an alcoholic, me an alcoholic, my son an alcoholic. And he's out in New York and he's beating his brains out. And I got two granddaughters with him and I can't get to see them because he don't like me too good. See, I got something he wants and he don't know how to get it. And he hasn't got the guts enough to get into AA and grab it like I did. He's looking for easy and softer methods and he meets people that tell him, you don't worry about the steps, you don't need them. Your father is wrong. He say, yeah, he's always wrong. And he goes along like that. And then the lights are lit in his head. And he can't possibly turn them lights out unless he does as his father did and everybody else in AA did. So he goes around with a head full of lights burning up there bright and he can't do nothing about them. And he tries to live this way and the lights kill him. They're burying him. So what that he does is come to AA for a couple of three months and listen to a bunch of nuts that don't know what they're talking about, tell them don't worry about the step, and the next thing you know he's out drunk again and in more trouble. Well, that's my story and that's my life. Now, I have made it as simple as I possibly can here tonight. There is nothing in this world that you can't do if you don't try. And if you're having a little trouble with this program, just think about what that I said and it will work for you just as surely as God made little apples. You can't miss. It's impossible to miss because this program was given to the alcoholic by the guy upstairs to help us and not to hurt us. And the steps won't get you drunk. They're designed to keep us sober. So why anybody should come into AA and reject the 12 steps of AA, I don't know. It's, it's impossible for me to understand. So I'm going to leave you now, I'll leave you with a little blessing. And, 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 and I'm just so happy to have been over here and in Brisbane and wherever the hell else I was for the last month. I don't even know where the hell I've been. <laughs> but I know one thing, I know where I'm going. I, I'm going to go home and I'm going to be so happy to get there. And I'll leave you with a little blessing. And a, much, much thanks. Because you've done much for me, you see. Without you people, I'm nothing. And without being wanted and needed and loved, I'm, I'm just nothing. So I'm very happy to have been here, and I want to say this to you. May the roads rise up to meet you, and may the windows be at your back, and may the sun gently warm your face and the rain softly fall on your fields. And until we meet again, may the good Lord hold us all in the hollow of his hand. Thank you, and God bless you all.
Would you all help me close the meeting with the serenity prayer? God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. And I'd like to thank Jack because for me the message that came over was that he came to get in his stage.